Renowned as much for his scholarship as for his holiness, and a leader and spiritual head of hundreds of thousands of Jews across the world, Rabbi Yekesiel Yehuda Halberstam lived through the worst parts of the Holocaust, losing more than most people could even imagine, and yet emerging to rebuild Jewish life by setting up a displaced persons camp in Western Europe and re-establishing an Orthodox Haredi community in Netanya Yisrael, and also one in Union City in New Jersey, raising funds to finance the building of a kosher slaughterhouse, the building of a kosher mikvah, acquiring and distributing religious articles such as tzitzit, tefillin and mesuzot, and helping couples marry and establish halakhic guidelines for men and women who had no proof of their spouse's death during the Holocaust, enabling them to remarry and start new families. He also established hospitals, outpatient clinics, medical centers, children's hospitals, old aged homes and orphanages. This man's achievements, taking into account his trying circumstances, is absolutely staggering. This is a man whose life perfectly exhibits what the Torah can do. If you will just constantly learn and follow it without complaining, second guessing it or switching it on and off at your discretion. Join me now for another episode of Insight into the Jewish Sages. Rabbi Yakuziel Yehuda Habestam, also known as the Klausenberg Rebbe or the Sanza Rebbe, named after the Sans Hasidic dynasty, which started under his great grandfather Chaim Halberstam, was born in 1905 in the town of Rudnik, Poland. At a very early age, he was recognized as a genius, being tested on the entire Talmud at age 13. His father, Rabbi V. Hirsch Halberstam, the Rav of Rudnik instilled in his son a great love of Hasidut and Torah scholarship, sharing with him many stories of how Chaim Halberstam learned, prayed, and conducted his Shabbat and holiday observances with total kavana. At age 14, his father passed away, and he received Shmicha later that same year. He went on to study under other leading Hasidic rabbis, including Rabbi Meir Yekiel of Ostrovsa and Rabbi Chaim Alazar Shapiro, also known as the Munkacha Rebbe. He also studied under his great uncle Rabbi Shalom Eliezer Halberstam of Ratzfurt. In latter years, he would periodically return to Rudnik to visit with his followers, who remained loyal to him even after the appointment of his first cousin, Rabbi Benjamin Titelbaum Halberstam, as rabbi in 1924. In 1921, Halberstam married his second cousin, Chana Titelbaum, the daughter of Rabbi Chaim Svi Titelbaum, the rabbi of Siget, Romania. The young couple lived in her father's house for the next five years. In 1927, at the age of 22, Halberstam accepted a post of rabbi of Klausenberg, the capital city of Transylvania, Western Romania. Although he was relatively young, he impressed the largely non-Jewish community with his charismatic personality, wisdom, and warmth toward Jews of all backgrounds. During the 16 years that Hubblestam led the Klausenberg community, he exhibited many of the qualities that would set him apart during his imprisonment by the Nazis. He slept only three hours a night, often on a synagogue bench, and he often ate only one meal a day, reserving bread for the Sabbath. He spent much of the day in prayer and study. His love for and faith in Hashem was legendary. He also paid special attention to children, funding a yeshiva in which 100 students learned at Klausenberg. The Rebbe's reputation spread throughout Romania, Hungary, and even reached Israel. In 1937, Halberstam was offered a seat in the Jerusalem Rabbinical Court, but uncertain as to whether he should accept the seat or stay with his community, Halberstam wrote to his mother in Rudnik for advice. She advised him to stay where he was, saying he was too young to accept such a position. Then, 
World War II broke out. The Jews of Hungary and Romania were not immediately affected by the German offensive against Polish and Lithuanian Jewry. However, local anti-Semitism flourished. Despite the danger, the Rebbe refused to leave and made no effort to save himself from further searches. Instead, he threw himself into helping refugees from Nazi-occupied lands and tending to his followers. Between 1941 and 1944, the Rebbe never stopped praying and studying Torah and praying for the Jewish people. On March 19, 1944, the Germans invaded Hungary and Gestapo chief Adolf Eichmann immediately organized the roundup, ghettoization and deportation of Hungarian Jews to Auschwitz. The Klausenberg Ghetto was established on May 1, 1944 and was liquidated via six transports to Auschwitz between late May and early June. Knowing that the Gestapo targeted community leaders first, the Rebbe hid in an open grave in a cemetery for several weeks. He then fled to the town of Banya, where he was conscripted into a forced labor camp along with 5,000 other Hungarian Jews. The Rebbe was forced to shave his beard, but he did not lose his composure or faith in Hashem. He continued to conduct prayer and Shabbat services where possible. About a month after the Rebbe's arrival, the labor camp was liquidated. All the prisoners were loaded into cattle cars and dispatched to Auschwitz death camp. At exactly the same time, the Rebbe's wife and nine other children who remained with her were sent to Auschwitz on a transport from Klausenberg. They were gassed to death in June 2, 1944. Halberstam, however, survived Dr. Joseph Mengele's selection and was sent to work. In Auschwitz, Halberstam seemed to live in another world. The bits of food that other prisoners hungered for and fought over in the Rebbe's eyes was far less important than using the food if it was kosher for a mitzvah. He decided early on to try and keep every Torah command he could and even the minhagim that he had learned from his forefathers. Thus he would often choose the bit of water that he had to wash his hands for prayer rather than wash his hands to eat. He never touched non-kosher food and he refused to eat food cooked in a non-kosher pot. Often he went hungry. His staunch faith gave spiritual strength to many people around him. He assured his fellow inmates that Hashem was with them in the valley of death and he would never abandon them. In 1944, a year after the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, Halberstam was assigned to a special labor detail to clear out the ruined ghetto. He and 6,000 other prisoners searched for valuables and demolished the ruins by hand so that the Nazis could sell the bricks and steel to Polish contractors. As they beheld skeletons piled in the street and uncovered bunkers in which Jews had died by gas or shooting, the Hungarian prisoners realized for the first time the extent of the annihilation of European Jewry. At this time also, the Rebbe did not shave his beard, which is considered a mark of holiness for Hasidim. He wrapped his beard and face in a handkerchief, pretending he had a toothache. This charade was accompanied by the fact that he cried all day as he worked, praying and communing with Hashem. When the prisoners began to hear rumors that their labor detail was to be liquidated, they decided to try to escape rather than let the Nazis kill them. However, the Rebbe encouraged them to adopt a wait and see attitude in response to one plan in which prisoners would storm the camp gates and make a run for the forest where they would connect with partisans. The Rebbe advised, until we see that the Nazis are about to exterminate us, it is prohibited for anyone to sacrifice his life and put himself in a situation of certain death. But one must remain vigilant and as soon as it becomes clear that the Nazis are ready to attack us, we must do everything in our power to rise up against them. The prisoners decided to follow his advice. Sometime later, after most of the prisoners had been transported to Warsaw, 500 remaining prisoners did stage a revolt. The Nazis killed every last one of them. As the Russian army moved closer to Poland, the Germans decided to liquidate the special ghetto clearing unit of which Halberstam was a member. All the prisoners were taken to a field outside of Warsaw, told to undress and stand near an open pit where soldiers prepared to machine gun them. At the last moment, however, a car sped into the field and a high ranking officer jumped out and communicated a special order from Berlin to stop the execution and send the prisoners to the Dachau concentration camp where they were needed as slave laborers. This unexpected reprieve, however, led to a brutal death march for the next week, the prisoners were forced by the SS, wielding wooden clubs and steel bars, to march 21 miles a day at top speed in the blazing July heat. The emaciated prisoners were deprived of food and water and allowed to rest only at night. Those who couldn't keep up were shot. 
On the third day, strained to the length of their endurance, the group was finally brought to rest for the night in a field surrounded by SS officers. As the guards slept, the Rebbe passed the word around. Everyone should dig beneath himself. Elohim's salvation comes in the blink of an eye. Each prisoner began to dig with his fingers, spoons, or pieces of wood. Remarkably, each found water, and a small spring began to pop up everywhere, quenching everyone's thirst and giving them new life. On the fifth day, the surviving marchers were packed into cattle cars for the rest of the journey to Dachau. Over the next few days, many succumbed to the overcrowding, lack of water, stench, and heat in the cattle cars. Of the 6,000 that set out on the death march, less than 2,000 made it to Dachau alive. The Rebbe was one of the survivors. From Dachau, the Rebbe was dispatched to Muldorf Forest, where the Nazis were building an underground airport hangar and missile batteries in order to bomb major European cities. He and thousands of other prisoners were forced to work 12-hour shifts, carrying 110-pound bags of cement from the rail depot to the cement mixers in the hangar. Halberstam grew very weak from this difficult work. When he collapsed under his burden, he was beaten, and he refused to work at all on Shabbat, which brought more beatings. Finally, his friends persuaded the camp managers to give him the job of camp custodian, allowing him to sweep and tidy the barracks while engaging in prayer the entire day. Despite the hardships and privations, Halberstam was a beacon of strength and hope for his fellow prisoners. When one died in an infirmary, hardly a noteworthy occurrence in those days, the Rebbe stood and eulogized him for having been a great Torah scholar in Hungary. He still refused to eat non-kosher food or food cooked in a non-kosher kitchen, subsisting only on bread and water during his nine months in Moldov. One prisoner watched him stand beside the cement mixer for hours at a time, collecting drops of water that dripped from the tank so he could use it for for ritual washing of hands. As the war wound down in spring 1945, the Germans disbanded Moldorf camp and sent the inmate population on yet another death march, chasing them from place to place without food or rest. Sometimes they were loaded aboard rail cars and driven to and fro. And on Friday, April 27, the train suddenly stopped in a small town and SS officers jumped aboard declaring you are free as they ripped their Wehrmacht badges from their uniforms. Many prisoners believed them and jumped off the train. But Halberstam told the people around him, Today is the eve of Shabbat. Where will we go? Then he added, My heart tells me that not everything here is as it should be. Suddenly, SS soldiers rode in on bicycles from all directions, firing machine guns and killing hundreds of people. At the same time, the American bombers dove in, strafing the field. Only Halberstam and those who stayed with him on the train escaped injury. Two days later, their real liberation came when the train stopped near a village and Nazi guards deserted them. American soldiers boarded the train with smiles, candy and chocolates. The survivors were brought to Feldafing DP camp near Munich, exhausted, demoralized and owning nothing except the rags they wore. Here Halberstam's leadership qualities rose to the fore and he became a spokesman and leader of the religious survivors. He immediately arranged for the proper burial of those who had died by the train tracks and demanded kosher food for the survivors. On the first Shabbat after liberation, he led the public prayer service in a newly opened synagogue and he delivered a two hour lecture quoting from memory scholarly writings that he had not seen in years. Halberstam's wife and 10 children were murdered by the Nazis during World War II. His eldest son survived the war, but succumbed to illness near a nearby DP camp before his father even knew that he had survived. Yet Halberstam never complained of his lot. He avoided depression by reaching out to others, and he spent much of his time listening to and comforting people of all ages. He brought hundreds of people back to religious observance through his passionate public speeches. There is much more that I can say of this man's story, but I will finish off here so that the viewer can contemplate what has been shared so far. The hardships that this man endured and his attitude in the face of such constant overwhelming horror is a testimony bar none of what the Torah has the power to do in a person. Today, the Klausenberg Rebbe's legacy still lives on. In the Tenya Yisrael, there is an orphanage originally founded by him that I support. If you want to have a part of this man's extraordinary blessings, please consider making a regular donation to this institution. Bye for now. Hey, before you go, if you like this series and you want to find out much more, check out our books, All Lights On in the Master's House, Lightning from the Master's House, Flying Chariot, Fallen Dragon, and Is Alcoholic. All available on Amazon.com and other online bookstores and help us to continue to spread the word. Also check out our website, netsroomantasy.com, 
where we have many teachings and resources on a myriad of subjects that will enlighten and enhance your walk. Bye for now.